Institute website, Facebook, YouTube, and especially on JewishJournal.com in Los Angeles. I hope you're enjoying your morning coffee as you watch this program. So again, and also to thank you to everybody coming here today who came out to the Hartman Institute on a cold <coughs> and wet Tuesday afternoon. So today's webinar, which is part of our annual David Hartman Memorial Conference for a Jewish and Democratic Israel. 2017 is a big year for anniversaries <coughs> for Israel and the Jewish people. In November, it's the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. In 19, in, excuse me, in June, in, also in November, is the 70th anniversary of the UN partition vote. And in June, of course, the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War. So we at the Institute will be addressing these events and their impact throughout the year especially in our summer programs. And here you see a slide about our summer program, which you can find more information about on our website. However, today our focus is 1967. The theme of our conference and of this program is Hayinu Kecholmim with a question mark. Or in English, were we, were we like dreamers? We'll discuss this question and the many others that it raises with Yossi Klein Alevi, prize-winning author, and senior fellow here at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. <coughs> in fact, we sort of borrowed the title from the entire conference from Yossi's prize-winning 2013 book, Like Dreamers. But first, a few programming notes. After our discussion, we hope to leave time for questions from our studio and online audiences. If you're watching online, you can post your questions on our Facebook page or send an email <coughs> from the link on our site. And for, of course, here in the audience, uh, we will be taking questions from you. And the questions will be from the microphone here on the side. So if you have a question, we'll give you time. Please line up at the microphone. We'll get to those in a bit. But one final note. In one week, we're going to conduct another live webinar program, a special program in response to the current discourse in modern orthodoxy about women clergy. This program titled Arguing for the Sake of Heaven, A Vision for Modern Orthodoxy, will feature Dr. Ilana Steinhain from the Shalom Hartman Institute office in New York. And that program will be aired on February 21, one week from today, beginning at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find out more about it on the website and sign up to watch it then. So now to our program. Yossi, I'd like to start by addressing some of the questions and the themes, as it were, that come up just from the title of your book and, as I said, the theme in, of our program. The, both the title of the book and the conference come from Psalm 126, which begins in Hebrew, Shir HaMalot, something I think a lot of people know. Or in English, a song of ascents. Shir HaMalot, B'Shuv Hashem, Et Shiva Tzion, Hayinu Kechomim. Now that is a very evocative phrase and so my qu first question to you today, Yossi, is why does this particular psalm have such resonance for the events of 1967 as you <coughs> captured them in your book and in the larger issues we're going to be discussing? So first of all, uh, hi, Alan. Good evening. <coughs> and good evening, everybody. It's uh, really wonderful to see a room full of friends and uh, some uh, close friends. I'm just delighted that we're all together. What... Um, what struck me about the, the word kicholmim, like dreamers, was the word like. <laughs> and whether being a dreamer is, is an unequivocally positive state. And I was interviewing one of the, the main characters in, in my book, Rabbi Yol Binun, who was one of the founders of the settlement movement and then became uh, its great heretic. He broke with, the, with his uh, fellow leaders uh, after the Rabin assassination. And he was one of the paratroopers on the Temple Mount that day. And I asked him, what was it like? You know, what, what were you feeling? And it was clear to me that what he experienced was in some sense more a, a feeling of dislocation than of ecstasy. And that is really what a dreamlike state is often like. 
is it's a sense of unreality, what's real, what isn't. Uh, there's something also vaguely disturbing in some ways about a dreamlike state. So that was one element that really drew me to, to that, that notion of, of what does it mean to be like dreamers. And, and to think that in retrospect, that we, we today experience June 1967, uh, I think in that kind of sense of dislocation, a combination of joy, of ecstasy, at least I do, <laughs> Uh, and also a sense of unreality and a, and a vague sense of disturbance, knowing what was going to come afterwards. And, uh, and then there's the question about like dreamers. And what really fascinated me about the seven characters that I focused on, some of them who became founders of the settlement movement, some who became leaders of the left, kibbutzniks, uh, was the balance that these men were trying to maintain between vision and reality. These, all of them, or most of them, were very practical people. And at the same time, they were visionaries. And we live, in some sense, in, in, in the consequences of their conflicting visions. And we live with the consequences of their often imperfect attempt to balance the vision with reality. So I want to take everybody back a little bit through uh, Yossi telling some stories from that time, and then we're going to come forward to today. And so I want to take you back a little bit. Um, uh, I think a lot of people here probably know the uh, pop song by Naomi Shammer, Jerusalem of Gold, which became the unofficial anthem of the Six-Day War and, the, and its aftermath. But in your book, Yossi, you tell a story that maybe some, is somewhat less known about a different song, a counterpoint song, Jerusalem of Iron, written by the Israeli folk singer Mayor Ariel. And he's also one of the important characters and, and personages in the book. So I want you to tell me a little bit about how Mayor Ariel came into this story. And we'll then take a minute to talk a little bit about the lyrics and the kind of that dreamlike state and some of the maybe even ambivalence that was uh, felt. He, by him in comparison to Jerusalem of Gold. So Mayer gave uh, an interview with uh, an Israeli journalist in the summer of 67 uh, about his song uh, Yerushalayim Shel Barzel, which he wrote as a counterpoint to Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. And uh, he was asked what motivated him to, to write the song. And he said, the medals got switched. <laughs> it was such a Mayer Ariel thing to say. And, and what he meant by that was that as a soldier experiencing earthly Jerusalem at its most traumatic moment at war, he could not sustain that, that fantasy idea of Jerusalem. He couldn't, the, the notion of, of, of Jerusalem of gold was in some ways unbearably sweet for him. It was an affront to his experience as a, as a combat veteran. And so he wrote that song, he began to write the song in the middle of the war. He wrote it uh, during a break in the fighting. Uh, he, uh, he once uh, told a story where uh, he was making fun of people who had assumed that he wrote this at the heat of combat. And he'd say, Yoriti, Katafti, Yoriti. And uh, unfortunately, I never knew him. I call him mayor. I feel like I know him. Uh, but uh, he died before I began the book. And, uh, and this is all from watching clips of other people interviewing Mayer. And, um, and so he writes this song in the middle of the war. It is adopted by the, the paratroopers as their official version of, uh, of 1967. And what it is about this song that I think the paratroopers loved was its combination of, um, of almost brutal realism, and at the same time managing to still express that sense of loyalty, of, of commitment. Uh, and it begins, uh, the, 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 the opening verses are... Uh, we, have, we have that, by the way, excuse me. For those of you uh, in our audience here who have the source sheet, we have the lyrics to the song in English. And those of you watching online, you can download and uh, look at the words of the whole song. Here we have just the opening, uh, kind of the, the choruses of the two. 
But uh, so the opening, the opening line, which is into your heart, into your darkness, Jerusalem, we found a loving heart. And that, I think, really sums up the sensibility of, uh, of Yerushalayim Shel Barzel, of Jerusalem of, of, of iron, uh, and of Mayer, of Mayer's uh, whole work. Uh, Mayer, um, there, are, there are Israelis today who are convinced that Mayer was our great cynic, our great bohemian, and there are other Israelis who are convinced that Mayer was our great uh, national lover, the great lover of, of the story. He was a lover in many ways, but also lover, great lover of the story of Israel. Uh, he became a religious Jew toward the end of his life, a very serious, observant Jew. Uh, and so everyone has their Mayor Ariel, and, and Yerushalayim Shel Barzel uh, is, um, is likewise a kind of litmus test for, um, for who you are as an Israeli. You can read Yerushalayim Shel Barzel and feel uplift, or you can see Yerushalayim Shel Barzel as the first, post, as the first song to come out of the Six-Day War to question the national euphoria and the, uh, the ethos of, uh, of 67, and I think that Mayer embodied both of those. That was the paradox uh, that he was trying to express here. So I want to now step back just a bit even before the beginning of the war, because May 1967 was a very different time from June 1967, and you've talked about this before, and you asked that we uh, make a point of understanding what happened in that time. You, know, you talk about May 67 Jews and June 67 Jews. So. In, in May 67, there was a sense of dread. I, I wasn't here, so I, I can't speak to it of personal knowledge, but I, my understanding was there was a sense of dread. There was, there was digging of trenches, some say perhaps even grave sites throughout the country. How, what happened? What was in May 1967? How did we move? How did the folks of the day move from <laughs> May till June? Well, I, I experienced May 1967 in Brooklyn. I was 14. And I would watch the news every night with my father, who was a Holocaust survivor. And there was this sense of impending doom that uh, we were barely two decades past the Shoah. And here it is, we have another genocidal threat. And I think that May 1967 has gone very deep into the consciousness of uh, many in my generation. And uh, we have forgotten May 1967 in our public discourse, and I think we need to bring May 1967 back. And the shock, I think there were multiple shocks in May 67. The first shock was Nasser blockades the Straits of Tehran and orders the UN peacekeeping forces who are patrolling, who are watching the border between Egypt and, and, and Israel, orders them packing. And the UN immediately complies. There is no Security Council discussion. Simply pack up and leave. And, and I think that that's crucial to understanding the deep sense of skepticism that exists among Israelis about the UN. And it's the UN subsequently did everything it could to confirm that skepticism. But uh, beyond that, skepticism of international guarantees. And I remember uh, Abba Evan, Abba Iban, uh, who was the foreign minister at the time, going from one capital to the next in the weeks before the Six-Day War, asking for international support. And France was the great friend of Israel up until the crisis of May 67, and France turned instantly into Israel's greatest enemy in Western Europe. In fact, de Gaulle, who was the uh, president at the time, uh, made one of the most anti-Semitic speeches that any Western leader has made since, since the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. He spoke about the Jews as a domineering and aggressive people. And so, that was, so there was the shock of France. And I remember my father telling me, don't worry, we have France. <laughs> and suddenly we don't have France. And then Abba Iban comes to Washington. And he meets with a very pro-Israel Lyndon Johnson, really one of the most genuinely pro-Israel presidents that we've had. And Johnson, uh, and Iban reminds Johnson of the promise that Eisenhower had made to Israel in 1957, when we withdrew from Sinai after the 56 war. And Eisenhower had said then, if Egypt ever blockades the, the Straits again, we will lead an international flotilla to break the, the blockade. And Johnson says, I wish I could. 
I'm busy in Vietnam, I can't launch a second war or risk a second war. And, uh, and by the way, uh, don't launch a preemptive strike. Those are Johnson's parting words to uh, Abba Ibn. And so Israel finds itself completely alone, except for world Jewry. This is the moment when the generation of native-born Israelis, who had grown up with a very strong sense of we're on our own here in terms of world Jewry, we're not really interested, uh, we, we may not even consider ourselves primarily Jews, we're Israelis first. This is the moment when Jewishness returns to Israeli identity, May 1967. Even before and, the war? Oh, absolutely. And, and it happens in, uh, in the tent camps uh, in the, of reservists who are waiting for war to break out. And the conversations that, that I, I tried to reconstruct were, were centered around that feeling of, on the one hand, aloneness, and the realization, well, we have world jewelry that we can depend on. So there was, also in Israel, was the, uh, the seeds, the opening of the um, mystical or even uh, the spiritual Jewish reclamation of all of the land of Israel in the, in the uh, center of Rav Kook, the son of the original Rav Kook, who had a vision or, and spoke powerfully in a way that uh, brought many people to, feel, to new feelings about Jewish. No, I mean, Alan, there's the, 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 the great story of, of Independence Day, May 1967. Uh, the day before Nasser orders the Straits of Tehran to be blockaded, the night before, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook of the Merkaz Harav Yeshiva uh, is addressing his students. And every year, Israeli Independence Day in Merkaz Harav is a day of, of unequivocal celebration. There is no sense of, well, Israel is a secular state, or there's, this is a gift from God, and we need to celebrate Yom Atzma'ut, Israel Independence Day, as one of our greatest holidays. And suddenly, he interrupts himself, and he tells the story of uh, the night of part when partition was voted on in the UN, and how there were, there were young people dancing in the streets, and he said, I couldn't join them. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't join them because they had broken the land. They had voted for partitioning the land. And he starts shouting, where is our Shechem? Have we forgotten it? Where is our Hebron? Have we forgotten it? And the students are sitting there stunned because Rav Tzvi Yehuda has never told the story before. He's never ruined the celebration of Independence Day with, with this outcry of longing. He's never indicated that, that there was something um, a, a, a wounded about, about the founding of Israel. That, that requires mourning rather than celebration. And then the next day, literally the next day, Nasser begins the process that leads to war. And three weeks later, many of those young people who were in that room uh, that night are in Hebron, in, in, in the old city, in Jerusalem, and uh, in, in Bethlehem. And, and the sense within the young, among young religious Zionists is that prophecy has broken out in Israel. And, so this, and, and many of those who are in that room that night go on to become the founders of the settlement movement. Hanan Porat, uh, uh, Levinger, uh, Yoel Bin Nun, they were in that room. Mm. And then many of those are then in, uh, some of them are actually power troopers in Jerusalem. And so what occurs to me, uh, what occurred to me as I was, as I was writing this, researching this, is that our story, including the founding of the settlement movement, it doesn't begin in June 67. It actually, it all begins in May 67. May 67 is what changed the Jewish people, in some sense as, as much as, as the war itself. How big was that group at that time, though? It was the, around the, uh, the, the yeshiva of Rav Kook. There was no settlement movement, per se. Was this? Everybody, where everybody was at no, the time? No, not at all. I mean, uh, Ruff Cook, Ruff Cook, the father, uh, who had died in 1935, was the revered figure in religious Zionism. But the truth is that many religious Zionists didn't really know Ruff Cook. They didn't really know his works. 
And Rav Tzvi Yehuda was regarded as a kind of a peripheral figure. Mm -hmm. Now, the yeshiva was called Merkaz HaRav, the center of the Rav. And they saw themselves as the cent certainly the center point of the Jewish people. And beyond that, I would say they really saw themselves as the center point of the cosmos. <laughs> and uh, not, not to be too grandiose about it, but uh, within, within religious Zionism and certainly within Israeli society, uh, Merkaz Harav was fairly peripheral until 1960s, until June 67, when word, when word, comes, when word gets out about Rav Tzvi Yehuda's speech. Mm. And when that speech was made at the time, it was not covered, never mind in the secular media, it wasn't covered in Hatzofeh, which was the newspaper of the religious Zionists. <coughs> Hatzofeh scrambles after the Six Day War to get a transcript of the speech, and then the speech becomes known reverently in religious Zionist circles as Mizmor Yud Tet, Psalm mm. 19. Why 19? Because it was the 19th anniversary of the state. And that is how it is known to this day in religious Zionist circles, Mizmor Yutet. So we're not going to, I don't think, spend any real time talking about the uh, persecution of the war. I'm sure that could fill an entire program in and of itself. Uh, but our focus here today is really about the impact and what the war has meant uh, since then, where society has gone. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead of past those six days. I hope you'll forgive me. They were remarkable, they're unforgettable, and there are many, many stories and movies that you all know or can certainly find out about them. But I wanted to skip ahead because, again, we're talking about what the, the impact of it and not the kind of mechanics of prosecuting the war. So in the days after the war, here we have a headline from an American newspaper. <laughs> Uh, war ends total Israeli victory. It's from the Springfield, Massachusetts Republican of all places. A gigantic banner headline. And here is one of the classic photos. I don't want to make it uh, twist your neck too hard, far, Yossi, but a picture many of you have seen. Uh, soldiers kissing the stones of the western wall of the Kotel <clears throat> right at the end of the war. Not the one that you've seen. This is a, from that same period when you see um, uh, Rav Gorin and the others walking through the Kotel. But this is the actual regular, as it were, regular soldiers. And here, the, the cheering soldiers, again, uh, feeling the joy of victory. And then right afterward, in the days afterward, <clears throat> we're going to get, in a sense, another kind of harbinger of things to come with what to do with the Western Wall Plaza, the Kotel uh, as it not, wasn't the Western Wall Plaza at the time, it was the Kotel, and it was, uh, it was, there was an Arab neighborhood built very close to the edge, and it, of course, had not been in Israeli hands for, 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 for ever, really, in Israeli hands. And um, it was the first time many Israelis had gotten to it. So there was a, there was a lot going on right then about the, the, what to do at the, at the Western Wall, which is, in fact, echoing to this very day. Well, when, uh, when the soldiers uh, reached the wall, they certainly uh, could never have imagined that it would become uh, um, the almost uh, private domain of, the, um, of, a, of a, an ultra-Orthodox dominated rabbinate. Uh, they, most of them, saw this as a national place of gathering, and that's certainly how it was experienced uh, in the in those early weeks, uh, I, I actually was in Israel in the summer of '67. I went with my father. Uh, he um, he had two brothers who had survived the war who he hadn't seen since then. And as soon as the war was over, he said, "That's it. We're going." And he they were here. They were here. Oh, wow. And he hadn't he hadn't seen them in those years. Travel was 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 very rare. Uh, all my friends came to the airport to see me off. It was a big thing. I was the first of my friends to go to Israel. And they were all there at the airport to see me when I came back. And, uh, and so what I remember of the wall that summer uh, was this sense of uh, national or really international gathering. That summer was the first time that very large numbers of diaspora Jews came as tourists. To, to Israel. Hundreds of thousands came, and there had never been anything like that. And uh, one of the most exciting scenes that I, I, I didn't witness because it happened just before I came, but I, I reconstructed in, in Like Dreamers, was the first Shavuot at the wall, 
which was the first pilgrimage to that site in 1800 years. It was the first mass pilgrimage. And people came from all over the country. You had hundreds of thousands of people converging on the wall. Uh, kibbutzniks, uh, everybody was there. And so there wasn't this sense of, 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 of constriction. There, there was the sense of, of the wall was this, you know, there's this legend about the temple that it was able to, to um, contain as many people as came, that the space just, just uh, expanded. And there, that was the sense that I had at the wall in, in, in the summer of 67. It was endless expanse. And now, of course, there's, there's a feeling of, of great constriction. Uh, there was a story that I, that I came across. I, I interviewed a paratrooper. I, I, it's one of the stories I wish, I wish had made it into the book, but uh, the book, when I submitted it to my publisher, was 800 pages long. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my editor said, uh, um, it's your funeral. If you, if you, if you, I, I said, I said, I have cut as much as I can. There's nothing more to cut. And so she used very, very, very uh, wise psychology on me. She said, "Go ahead. It's your funeral." And so then I said, "Wait a minute." <laughs> She's telling me to publish, and then so then I ended up cutting 200 pages, and this story got cut. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories, uh, and it it relates directly to to the point you're raising. Uh, one of the uh, paratroopers. Uh, who uh, was wounded in, uh, in the battle for Ammunition Hill was a guy named Avraham Sela. Avraham Sela was an Iraqi-born Jew who, who had been very right-wing in the years before the war and dreamed of, of, of conquering Jerusalem. And so he's wounded in the first minutes of the battle for Ammunition Hill. He misses that extraordinary moment of return and he's following this on the radio, and he's just waiting for the moment when he can leave his bed and go to the wall. And the way he, tell, he told the story was um, uh, sometime in the summer of 67, uh, he was transferred to a um, a, Beit a, a, um, a, convalescence. a convalescence home. And, and uh, he asked the driver, please, let's stop at the wall. So they stop at the wall. And he starts walking toward the wall, and he says, I was hunched, and I'm walking like this, and every step was painful. And suddenly, he hears a voice, a voice. And the voice says, Bachor, Sim Kippah. <laughs> put, for those listening abroad, put a kippah on your head. And Avram Sela suddenly realizes that in, in his an emotional state he had forgotten to put on a kippah. But he is so outraged by this intrusion into his most sublime moment that he turns his back on the wall, walks away, and never goes back. Wow. That, to me, is a counter story of June 67. With all the emotional outpouring, there's the story of, of Avram Sela, which, in its way, is a, is a foreshadowing of uh, how so many Jews feel about the wall today. Well, again, I'm, I'm not sure how widely this is known, but I was just reading up on this recently, and, it, and I read that, in fact, right after the war, there was a dispute in the government here about whether the National Parks Authority or the rabbinate would take control of the wall. And right. Levi Eshkol gave it to the rabbinate. Maybe he, I'm not sure if anybody knows. If you know, I'm, I'd love to hear if you think why he did it. But even if we don't know, Clearly, that decision has led to a chain of events that, you said, instead of this expansion, a, contract, a con contraction, constriction of the wall itself. Bear in mind that the rabbinate of 1967 was very different from the rabbinate today. It wasn't a Haredi rabbinate. It was religious Zionist. The religious Zionists were his coalition partner. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Six-Day War, uh, there was this sense of religious Zionism finding its, its place uh, in Israeli society, in the mainstream. Uh, and um, it was a very different dynamic. But that, of course, opened the way to more and more constriction. So now, you started to mention uh, how you came with your father and that this was the first time, perhaps, or one of the few times when mass numbers of uh, Jews from around the world, and I imagine others, but particularly 
Jews and American Jews started coming to the uh, to Israel. My my grandmother came. I was a year. I'm a year or two younger than Yossi. Uh, and my grandmother came here in June 1967. She left my grandfather. She left everything. She came with a group, and she was here. And she brought back the talit I wore at my bar mitzvah that fall. And my rabbi wasn't at the bar mitzvah because he was here in Israel at the hmm. time. So there, this is a, obviously, I don't generally like to generalize from the particular, but this is a story that suggests just how many, and after that, my grandmother, was, it was not a thing in our family, it really wasn't. So for her to take that on and to go at a time, and as Yossi said, it was a more complicated, difficult time to travel. Tell me what it was like for the, the American Jews and, and diaspora Jewry to feel the power of Israel expressed in this <clears throat> dramatic way? I think the most dramatic impact on the diaspora happened to that Jewish community which actually couldn't come here in the summer of 67, which were the Soviet Jews. Uh, that was the beginning of the transformation, the revolution. Uh, and it begins in, uh, in the, during the war itself uh, when a Moscow University student named Yasha Kazakov uh, writes an open letter to the Kremlin, dear Kremlin, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I hereby renounce my Soviet citizenship and I regard myself as a citizen of the state of Israel. And nothing like this had ever happened in the Soviet Union. And Kazakov has the presence of mind to meet with the correspondent for the Washington Post in Moscow. He gives the letter to him. The, the letter is published six months later in the Washington Post, and Kazakov shows up in Israel. He's given a visa because the Soviets realize this is a troublemaker, let's just get rid of him. And he's already gotten publicity in the West. That begins to, to that opens the way to literally thousands of letters that are being written in those early years after the Six Day War. And uh, Sharansky has this very powerful uh, description of uh, the impact of, uh, of the war on him and on his friends, where he says in May 67, uh, the anti-Semites all around him in Soviet society were celebrating. And suddenly June 67 turns anti-Semites into philo-Semites. <laughs> They're all bragging about how, uh, how our Jews beat the Arabs. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was the moment of Sharansky's transformation. So June 67, has the, and, and before that, again, really May 67, it's the combination of existential fear, relief, and euphoria. It's that emotional trajectory that transforms Jewish life. And, and nowhere, again, as dramatically as the Soviet Union. The fact that we have a million and a half former Soviet citizens in this country is a direct result of 1967. Uh, I was reading again, uh, Sharansky wrote it uh, after it. He said that when they heard the words, the Temple Mount is in our hands, they felt pride. He said, I didn't even know right. what the Temple Mount was. That's right. That's so, right. so clearly it was one of those early moments. And um, hmm. uh, so, okay, so we have the, the diaspora response and uh, the kind of the birth of the Soviet uh, Jewry movement and the uh, movement of uh, hundreds of thousands, million and a half uh, former Soviet Jews to, to Israel. And in Israel itself, the, the, um, the stirrings of religious Zionism as a, not just a fringe or a, uh, um, a movement on the, on the periphery, but a central factor in Israeli society. Mm -hmm. And you've also talked about how Jewish consciousness, you started talking about this, let's hear some more, Jewish consciousness entering into the Israeli identity, which had been very secular for the most part, mm -hmm. in, again, throughout <clears throat> mainstream Israel. Now, you see the beginnings of Jewishness emerging in Israeli music at that time. Mm. Hasidic music becomes popular. The Hasidic Song Festival. Um, there's this sense of nostalgia for something that Israeli society had lost, had deliberately displaced. And you see it among some of the leaders of the labor movement. You see it uh, on the kibbutz movement around uh, the circle of intellectuals, young intellectuals, who published a magazine called Shtemot, uh, which uh, is in active quest for, uh, for Jewish spirituality. Though they're, especially you read those, those uh, issues after the war, they're very powerful. Uh, and yet that movement 
doesn't really go anywhere. And the question is, what happens? It stops. And my theory is that what stopped it was the intrusion of the political debate over the future of the territories. And the instant transformation of religious Zionism from one of the most moderate political communities in Israel uh, to, the, to the point where the uh, ministers represented, cabinet ministers representing the National Religious Party were initially opposed to sending the paratroopers in to the old city. Really? Yeah. Uh, Mapam, the, the, Marxist, the Marxist Zionist movement, together with the National Religious Party, were, were the, the block of the skeptics in the cabinet, and Moshe Dayan initially as well. But after the war, Dayan had some, his own uh, <clears throat> spiritual awakening or awareness, right? And he gets to the Western world, he gets to the hotel for yes, the, the old city yes. for the now, first now, time. Now there's this almost universal spiritual stirring uh, among secular Israelis in one form or another, uh, which, which does not last. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the religious Zionist movement becomes the, the, the avant-garde for settlement. I think the moment where it really starts to get complicated is, um, is not with the founding of the first settlement, which is Kfar Etzion of September 1967. There was, there was virtually unanimous consensus on reestablishing Kfar Etzion, which of course had been destroyed on the literal eve of Israel's independence in 1948. And so the restoration of Kfar Etzion is seen as, as self-evident. But six months later, a group of Jews uh, go into downtown Hebron and announce that they're not leaving. That triggers the debate over the future of the territories that we've lived with for the last 50 years. And the fact that that debate took on immediately with the, with the settlement in Hebron took on religious, a religious connotation. So the secular religious divide begins to conflate with the with the political becomes deadly for this um, very um, um, passing, this, 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 this fluid moment of, uh, of Jewish identity, uh, which, which isn't able to continue. And of course then, or from then, literally until today, uh, settlements, which ones, where, how, when, why, etc., which government backing, which kind of winking and nod, which um, uh, official approval, which unofficial approval, this like little inching forward has continued to this very day with all of these issues kind of out there, but not really, I don't know if they ever really get aired out in, in a way that you know, uh, allows so, us to get anywhere. What's so with interesting uh, is that uh, the debate as we know it today was more or less expressed in the summer of 67. Hmm. Which is to say, we've been arguing for 50 years over exactly the same points with no sense of fatigue. This is how Jews <laughs> argue. And there's something astonishing about it. You're and, not and, tired of it? Uh, I'm a little tired of it. I, I am. I am tired of it. I, mean, I spent 11 years writing a book about it, okay. so I, I'm really tired of it. <laughs> but but what, was amazing, what was amazing to me was finding uh, the articles uh, op-eds in the summer of 67, especially by, by two of Israel's leading writers. One was the poet Natan Alterman, who was Israel's greatest poet in the uh, period of the early years of the state. And Natan Alterman, who was a man of the Labor Party, um, founds the movement for the, the, the Hatnu'ah, um, uh, the movement for the complete land of Israel. And uh, this is Natan Alterman. And he gathers around him uh, mostly uh, people of the left uh, with a few kind of token right-wingers. And, um, and somebody says to him at that first meeting, you know, maybe we should reach out to the camp of religious Zionists. And like that's an idea that hadn't quite occurred to the, to the annexationist movement mm. in the summer of 67. Now, um, against, rising up against Alterman is a young novelist named Amos Oz. 
And Amos Oz writes, there is no such thing as a benign occupation. And he also writes, there's no such thing as liberated territory. Land cannot be liberated, only people can be liberated. And in trying to liberate the land, we may end up um, uh, imprisoning people. This is the debate, and then Altamont is responding. Altamont is, is warning against the consequences of withdrawing uh, back to the vulnerable borders of May 67. The memory of, of that vulnerability is what impels this move, the annexationist movement. And so this debate among writers, this literary, the debate over the future of the territories begins in the summer of 67 as an argument between Israel's greatest poet and Israel's emerging greatest novelist. And, and it's, it's all there. And it's, 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 it was so moving to read and also sobering and frustrating because it, it, it means that in some, in some way, left and right have been stuck in, a, in, 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 in grooves that, that at least the ideologues haven't been able to, to transcend. Now, we could really spend this session and many others just staying within those days and digging a little deeper. But I think, uh, for, again, for the purposes of, uh, of our, our session and the thoughts for the year, we're going to kind of leap forward, just uh, take a great leap forward, as they used to say, just a little bit to today. <laughs> just bear with me. We're in a time machine. Boom, it's now 19, uh, 2017. It's 50 years later. Um, imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> it, that. We cannot forget anything that happened and all the many things along the way. But just, again, for purposes of the conversa conversation. Just a few weeks ago, you wrote a very lengthy and really worthwhile reading piece in the Wall Street Journal about how Israelis view the territories and the settlements. And you tried to parse out and pull apart the tangled threads and, and take the time to um, explain to the American readership of the Wall Street Journal and hopefully many others just how complex and just how nuanced and how uh, fraught this whole conversation is and how it often goes in world capitals without uh, particularly the particularly even Washington under Democrats and Republicans a real sense of understanding so again jumping forward to that from that jumping off point of Alterman and um, and uh, Amos Oz to today uh, and that groove that uh, they were in that kind of we're still stuck in where are we today in 50 years later well I, I think the good news here is that a majority of Israelis uh, are not in that groove anymore. Mm. I think that what has happened as a consequence of, of uh, reality, of, of, uh, of encountering uh, not abstract ideology, but the reality on the ground, is that a majority of Israelis have concluded, um, have, have reached two insights about our conflict with the Palestinians. The first is that the left was correct all along from the very beginning, from the summer of 67, that occupying another people is a uh, disaster and potential death sentence for Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. That is a position that a majority of Israelis accept and uh, Netanyahu accepts it. Netanyahu at least says he does. And the, the, and the, second, the second position, uh, which the same majority um, accepts is that the right was correct all along when it warned us that we can't make a peace agreement with a Palestinian national movement which denies our legitimacy, our, our rootedness in this land, denies our history, denies uh, our peoplehood, <laughs> refuses to accept us as a legitimate people. And uh, that is a story that plays out on a daily basis in the Palestinian media. And it's not only the media of Hamas, it's also the media of our erstwhile peace partners in Fatah and Palestinian Authority. And so most Israelis today are simultaneously uh, a little bit left and a little bit right. And what comes out when you're a little bit left and a little bit right is a centrist. And, and the problem with the Israeli center is that it isn't yet clearly defined it's more of a mood than, a, than an explicit ideology. But I, I believe that a majority of Israelis today are centrists. And a centrist would say, 
that on the one hand, a Palestinian state is an existential necessity for us. And on the other hand, the Palestinian state is potentially an existential threat for Israel, both simultaneously. And what I found so maddening as I was going through the decades in trying to piece, to, 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 to restructure uh, what Israel sounded like between, in, in those decades after 67, what I found so maddening was that, 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 mono, that, that mutual, that monologue where left and right were just shouting at each other uh, their, their truths was, I just wanted to shout at both of them, you're both right. And, and we've come to the point today where I think a majority of Israelis, however reluctantly, would say, well, the left was, had a point and the right had a point. The tragedy for our discourse was that each camp saw very clearly the fatal flaw in the argument of the other camp, mm -hmm. but was never able to really offer us a realistic way out of our dilemma. If that is true, and I, I think it, it, it feels right to me, as you put it, it, first of all, it's not what we hear in our media. It's not what we hear in the streets, as it were. And without asking you to pick a political side or a politician or a party that you think is, uh, should, be, uh, should be there, uh, I don't see that, that at least... In this sense, politicians and our leaders are lagging indicators and not leading indicators. They're not even leading from behind, they're way behind. And how do we kind of switch that so that that uh, discourse, that reasonable discourse that <coughs> accepts the truth on both sides can actually get ahead and not get shouted out either by the extremes or just not even have a, a voice? Look, the center has suffered from very poor leadership. The last really strong and effective leader that the center had was, however improbably, uh, Arik Sharon. Uh, Sharon, as an elder statesman, after he was elected prime minister, remade himself into the one, of, one of the most remarkable political reconstructions in Israeli history, from the leader of the hard right to the leader of the center. And Sharon understood that after the second intifada, there was now a new political center in Israel that hadn't existed before. And he tried to embody that. He founded a party which did not outlast him, Kadima, which had terrible leadership, part of which is in jail. <laughs> and uh, maybe the other part belongs in jail, I don't know. But, uh, but it was, um, it was a, a um, the, the center has suffered consistently from, from weak leadership. Now we have Yair Lapid, uh, who according to the recent polls, uh, would emerge if elections were held today as, uh, uh, as head of the largest party. And he is, he is the first person really since the implosion of Kadima who's trying to recapture the center. I think what's so interesting about the center is even though one centrist party after another fails, going back to 1977 with, uh, with Daesh, the, the democratic movement for change of Yigal Yadin, which was really in some sense our first attempt at a centrist party, and that completely disintegrated. Then you had Shinui, Yair's father Tommy. There have been one attempt after another, and every time a centrist party fails, another centrist party emerges, and it, and it manages to get a substantial number of support, despite the failure of the predecessors. So I think that that points to a real hunger in the Israeli public for for a, a political voice that transcends the certainties of, of the left and the right. I don't know if that's going to emerge anytime soon, but I'm going to want to now jump a tiny bit ahead into the future, just one day. Because in one day, our current leader, the Prime Minister, is going to be meeting with the current President of the United States, Donald Trump. And, um, Tonight, the prime, our Prime Minister is in Blair House, which is a photograph, if you can see here, uh, of the pr uh, Prime Minister getting settled into Blair House. Blair House, if you don't know, is the official guest house of the United States government, and visiting leaders often stay there. Now, in recent years, because of the animosity between uh, Obama and the previous President of the United States and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu very pointedly stayed in hotels, and whether he was not invited or declined, I, I can't say. 
Sunday. I don't really know. But he didn't stay there, and that's a fact. And the fact tonight is that he is, in fact, in Blair House, perhaps expecting a warmer welcome. However, we have a prime minister who doesn't seem to be speaking to the center that seems to not have a voice, and an American president who doesn't have an articulated position that is clear. Is that is that a nice enough way to say that? About either the Middle East or Israel. Um, and um, so let's just take a tiny jump ahead because right now we're facing a time when not just the center is quiet, as you know, you'll see, as you said, but the uh, the edges are are pulling apart. Uh, the you know, um, Naftali Bennett is, is said he doesn't want Netanyahu to say the words two state solution, and he and Netanyahu has been resisting and a push me pull you kind of thing with the with the extreme right. He wants to keep his coalition together, but he doesn't want to go too far because I think he knows what the things you're saying. So let's get a little specific, a little talkless, a little granular here on just a few things before we open it up to questions. Um, again, tomorrow is the very first face-to-face -face meeting with President Trump. Um, what, what is going to happen there? What are they going to talk about? And, and what is Netanyahu, let's be more specific, what is Netanyahu hoping for uh, with his meeting with uh, President Trump? What do you think? Well, first of all, and second and third of all, it's Iran, Iran, Iran. Mm. That, is, that has been the, um, the justifiable obsession of Netanyahu. Uh, until now, he has failed to, um, to, to move the, the international community uh, in, in, in a confrontational direction, uh, a, a direction I think that we, we are heading toward. I think we we need to head toward. I'm I'm extremely hawkish on Iran. Mm. Uh, if maybe I'm to the right of Netanyahu <laughs> on this. Uh, and so, in that sense, a little bit right, a little bit left. In that sense, in that sense, I um, I take the existential threat of Iran very seriously. Uh, I see the deal that was signed uh, last year as a betrayal, uh, not just of Israel but of the Arab world. And that's certainly how Sunni countries have responded. And it is a deal, I mean, with, without opening that up again, uh, it's a deal that, uh, that is, I believe, unsustainable. And, uh, and the question is, at what, and this is a question that the Israeli uh, intelligence community asks itself, at what point does the deal need to be broken? Now, the consensus, more or less, in the Israeli strategic community today is that the deal should not be broken now. The deal is buying us a few years of time. That's, we need that. But the fatal flaw of the deal is that it's open-ended, and it leaves, ultimately, a path uh, uh, to a nuclear Iran, which is uh, unstoppable because the sanctions uh, uh, mechanism uh, has been dismantled, and the only old, the only way to stop Iran ultimately will be through military means. So, ironically, what this deal has done is, on the one hand, bought us time, and on the other hand, made a military confrontation almost inevitable. So, I think that's what they're going to be talking about: is how do we start ratcheting up the pressure on Iran now, letting the Iranians know that what was is not what's going to be. Uh, and uh, the, um, they are now under a microscope. So that's the first positive outcome that I hope will happen here. Um, the second uh, po uh, positive outcome that I'm hoping for is a resurrection of the Sharon Bush understandings from 2004, which is that Israel has tacit approval to build within reason in places like Malay Adumim, Gush Etzion, uh, and not expand the, the borders of the blocks, and certainly not build outside the blocks. Now, this is, I was very happy when uh, the Trump administration slapped us on the wrist last week, uh, after uh, Netanyahu made several announcements about settlement building. Uh, the administration waited until the third announcement, the third announcement was Netanyahu getting a little bit carried away with himself and saying, not only are we building 5,000 apartments, but we're going to build a new settlement for, for the former residents of Amona. 
that would have been the first new settlement built since the early 90s. And that's when the Trump administration stepped in. Whoever was giving them advice gave them good advice in this case. And, uh, and if, you, if you paid attention to the statement, it was the mildest rebuke that we've ever gotten on settlements. It opened with, while we don't believe that settlements are the major, are, are the major obstacle to peace or even an obstacle to peace, I think it might have even gone that far. Uh, we, we, we believe that there needs to be caution here, etc. Uh, what I, my initial fear of Trump, I, I, have, I have several Israel-related fears that are still, still um, actuali, as we say, uh, but um, actual in English. <laughs> but, uh, you got there, right? <laughs> but uh, my, my initial fear is something that I'm, I'm, I'm a little calmer about today, and that was that... Um, Trump was going to uh, strengthen the Israeli far right, that he would see the Israeli far right as, uh, as his natural allies, uh, and that we were going to move from a J Street presidency of the last eight years to a ZOA presidency uh, for the next uh, however long he's in office. And, uh, and so that really, that worried me, and I'm a little, I'm a little less worried about that now. I don't think Netanyahu wants a, um, a, a ZOA president. That would be and, uh, just the Zionist organization. organization of America, which is the equivalent of J Street on the, on the farthest right of the, of the American Jewish mainstream, if one can call it that. And, um, and so I don't, I hope we're not going to a ZOA presidency and, uh, and that, uh, we'll see Netanyahu um, getting what I think he wants, which is Trump holding him back. Hold me back, hold me back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that he'll be able to come back here and tell Bennett, et cetera, that uh, it's, it's much better than it's been the last eight years, but it isn't, uh, it's not paradise for, for the settlement movement. It's not a blank check. It's not a blank check. Okay, but so you brought Iran in, and, and we can't, of course, talk about Israel-U.S. Uh, relations without Iran, but I do want to find a way to circle back to our theme, and, and maybe this is an opening. Um, there is a tacit wink and a nod understanding that Israel is working in certain ways with certain mm -hmm. Arab countries, certain Muslim countries throughout the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia. Nobody really knows, but clearly something more than in the past has gone on. But it's almost always under the table, quiet, and the words are like, if you really talk about it, it's going to fall apart. And it seems that some people have said, and maybe this is not true, I don't know, but that if in fact Israel were to really show some movement towards either the uh, Arab League's suggestions for a two-state solution or some real uh, movement with the Palestinians, that some of this subter subterranean <laughs> cooperation, which circles mm -hmm. back to an anti-Iran yes. uh, setup, would come out of the, the would come out into the open. Supposedly, uh, Jared Kushner and, and is thinking along these lines. But I don't think we're going to see any of these countries, no matter how much they really want Israeli support and are afraid of Iran and want to work, to really openly say, yeah, we're, we're, this, we're together until there's real <laughs> movement with the Palestinians. And is that... Maybe from the outside in, some kind of a prod to us and even to the Palestinians. Look, I don't believe that we can reach an agreement, any agreement, with this generation of Palestinian leaders. At the same time, the one silver lining that I see in the Iran deal is that we are not a pariah anymore in the region. We now have potential allies, even if it's just... Um, uh, allies for convenience uh, in places we could never have imagined before, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states. Uh, Egypt and Jordan are starting to act like real signatories to a peace agreement with Israel for the first time. And so my hope is that we're going to revisit the Saudi plan. Uh, the Saudi plan in its initial form was a non-starter. First of all, it wasn't intended for Israel. It was intended for American public opinion in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. It 
That was the purpose of the Saudi plan, to let the American people know that even though most of the hijackers were Saudis, Saudi Arabia is still uh, for peace. And as a consequence of that, uh, the Saudi plan didn't bother speaking to Israeli concerns. It was a diktat. Uh, it, it, uh, it said in exchange for a complete Israeli withdrawal without without any exceptions to the 67 line uh, in, in, and accepting the accepting right of return, uh, the Arab League will recognize Israel. Of course, there won't be much of an Israel left to recognize after the right of return. And so we need to revisit the Saudi plan, first of all, because it is the first time that any plan was put on the table that, that offered Israel peace under any terms with the entire Arab world. And what I find attractive about the Saudi plan is that it places the, the conflict in its proper dimensions. This is not ultimately a conflict between mighty Israel and, 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 and the Palestinians. This is a conflict between Israel and the Arab and Muslim worlds. And the Saudi plan is a reminder of the real dimensions of this conflict. So we need to revisit the Saudi plan. We need to explain to the Saudis that it is an opening and not a final statement, which is how they initially intended it. And there is no such thing as 22 Arab countries telling Israel this is what the peace is going to look like. Uh, and some of those countries, in fact, don't really exist anymore. Syria, Libya, Yemen, these are, these are fictitious countries now. So, so we need to rethink Israel's place in the region. And I believe deeply that, that we need to find a way out of the occupation. And when I use the word occupation, I should just add, I use it in a very specific way. I do not mean uh, the occupation of the territory. I don't believe that we are occupiers in Judea and Samaria. It is mine. A Jew is not an occupier in Judea. But we are occupying another people. And this people happens to live in my ancestral land. I wish that that wasn't the case. But the tragedy of this conflict is that the land between the river and the sea is actually conceptually two lands. It's the land of Israel and the land of Palestine. And it is in its entirety the land of Israel and in its entirety the land of Palestine, which is why when I see maps in the Palestinian Authority uh, that don't show Israel, that it's all Palestine, I personally am not offended by that. Mm -hmm. Because for me, my internal map doesn't have Palestine on it. It's all Israel. And so the starting point for negotiations is Shnai Mochzin Betalit, Two people are holding onto a garment. Ze omer kulashali, ze omer kulashali. Each side says, it's all mine. And what does the Mishnah say? You divide it in half. What if one party says it's all mine and the other party says it's half mine? What happens? How much does the one who says it's all mine get, Micha? Three quarters. Three quarters. <laughs> and the other gets a quarter. To my mind, what one of the many fatal mistakes that the Israeli left, and by extension the diaspora Jewish left, makes is by saying it's half mine. Because we are facing a negotiating partner, potentially, who, who says as a matter of course it's all mine. I have to respect that. Yes, you're right. Haifa is yours. The problem is that uh, Hebron is mine. So what do we do? And if that's the starting point, then we have a chance of re potentially of reaching partition. But when the Jewish left says, it's not mine, it's occupied territory, the Palestinians don't talk about, about, about Jaffa and Haifa as being, as being the state of Israel. That is Palestine. And so fine, let's, let's face reality. It is all Palestine for them, and it's all Israel for us then let's sit down and work out a deal. That's why I believe that the Israeli public keeps re-electing right-wing prime ministers. What Israel, I think what the Israeli public or a majority of the public wants in a prime minister is what Netanyahu is giving them, which is he's <laughs> saying, I want a two-state solution, but he is not delivering. 
And that's what most of us really want. That's the truth. We're too afraid for very good reasons. We're too afraid of actually creating a two-state solution, but we're too afraid of annexation. We're too afraid of letting go of the hope that one day we'll be able to extricate ourselves from this impossible situation and create a, a, and preserve a Jewish and democratic state. So I'm going to ask you one more short question. And while I do that, anybody in the room here who wants to ask a question from Yossi, I ask you to start lining up here at the microphone and we'll take as many questions as we have time for. And our associate Max, who has been, I hope, collecting some questions from folks online, I'll also invite him to come to the microphone. And um, I, the first question, by the way, I'm going to skip ahead to the easiest question, which is uh, we already had from somebody who asked, when's your book coming out in Hebrew? Uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a softball. I, uh, I know. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully by, uh, by the 50th anniversary in, uh, in May, um, if not by Rosh Hashanah, inshallah. Okay. So we didn't even get to ask about the, uh, maybe someone will help me here and ask about the plan or the proposal, the idea of moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem because I want to get to the audience. So if you had that question, I'm happy to take it. If not, you feel free to ask your first question. Please tell us your name, where you're from, and, and of course make your question as short and in as much a form of a question as you can. No speeches is what I mean. No speeches. I'm Neil Sandler. I am a conservative rabbi from Atlanta, Georgia here in Israel on sabbatical. My question for you, Yossin, first off, thank you for all of the comments that you've shared here this evening with us. My question for you is this, can we speak today of Israel's soul? And if so, how would you describe its nature and what its state is today? Thank you. That's not a softball. It's a, very, it's a very divided soul. It's a, it's a schizophrenic soul. Uh, it, wants, it wants many things simultaneously, and it can have all of them. Um, part of it wants the wholeness of the land, and I'll, I'll, I feel that my soul is, is schizophrenic in exactly that way. Uh, I want the wholeness of this land. When I look at the, at the pre-June 67 map, uh, it looks to me uh, like it has been gnawed, G-N-A-W-E-D, gnawed. It's, there's, there's something almost grotesque about those borders, eight miles wide at, the, at its narrowest point. I crave the borders of the Jordan River. That's, that, Israel is diamond-shaped in its wholeness. And, uh, and, and, and the thought of giving up Judea and Samaria to the control of one of the unholiest national movements uh, on the planet, uh, which is either Fatah or Hamas, is, is, is inconceivable to me. So part of me, part of the Israeli soul, wants that land. Uh, the other part, another part of the Israeli soul, which I share as well, uh, is, um, is traumatized by the fact that not only have we been occupiers for 50 years, but we've gotten used to it. It doesn't really trouble us the way it, uh, it once did. Uh, I moved to Israel in 1982, and there was a very, very passionate conversation going on in different parts of Israeli society then that, that, that reached a kind of peak in the 1990s about the moral consequences of occupation. And that ended for all practical purposes with the Second Intifada. And it ended to a large extent for me too. I have to force myself to have that conversation because I don't want it. Emotionally, I'm not there anymore. But I know intellectually that if we don't continue that conversation, then we're lost. So where are we? We are, we are torn. Uh, and we're torn for very good reasons. Um, I think that, that we also are... Um, are remarkably adept at adaptation. We are the world champions at adapting to trauma. And uh, I'll give you an example, just a small example. I live in, in French Hill in, in, in Jerusalem, and the train, the new, the not so new anymore, the light rail uh, goes by. Uh, one, of, one of the stops is, is at French Hill, and there was a stabbing there maybe a year ago. And I heard it on the news, and I went over 
to the station to see. I got there about an hour later and there was nothing there. Just people waiting at the station. And that's Israel. Now we also pay a very high price for, for our ability to adapt and that is we, we, we shut down. And I think we, we, we are a society in post and pre-traumatic stress. Uh, we're always between traumas. And, uh, and so we, 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 we aren't always aware of the state of our soul. It's not a question that many Israelis uh, ask. Before you go, I'm going to ask our friend Max to cut the line so we get a, one or two questions from our online viewers. Um, so, and then we'll come back to you. you. I appreciate your patience. Okay, we'll take the questions in the order uh, that they were received online. Uh, the first question uh, is from Rabbi Arye Burke uh, from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he says, how do you explain to generations after May 1967 that do not know the feeling of impending doom and destruction? You know, this was a question that, that American Jews could ask uh, before November 2016. And what has struck me about the conversation uh, among liberal American Jews is how tra traumatized and even uh, Holocaust-centered the rhetoric has become. Liberal American Jews who denounce Netanyahu for invoking the 1930s in relation to the Iran threat now speak about the 1930s. It's now conventional, it's accepted in parts of American Jewry to speak about this time as the 1930s because you had a bad election. Now, now forgive me really for being, for being um, uh, slightly cynical uh, about the the liberal American Jewish discourse, but if, if, if a bad election can suddenly open up the abyss for American Jews, who until, this, who until that moment were so sure that America is different, that American Jewry is different, uh, then maybe this is a conversation we can start to revisit. Maybe Israel, is, Israelis' feelings of vulnerability, not victimhood, Israelis do, do not feel like victims and never feel like victims. <laughs> Israelis despise victimhood, but Israelis certainly feel deeply vulnerable in the Middle East. And maybe that's a conversation that the Trump era can allow us to have again with liberal American Jews. Because what I sensed all these years from J Street, from others, was a, 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 a blindness, this obtuseness to, to ha what we were actually experiencing on the ground and not connecting Israeli reality with the, the vision uh, that uh, J Street uh, has, which, which in principle I share, uh, of a two-state solution. And so if we speak about Israelis' feeling of vulnerability going back to May 67 and periodically erupting ever since, uh, maybe American Jews, even young American Jews, are more receptive to that conversation now. Yes. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm from Westchester, New York. And uh, I'm here on the Chavruta program oh, for the year. Um, <clears throat> my question was about um, the dependence of Israel on American Jewry. And you mentioned May 67. Also, pre-48, there was um, there's an, a Jewish voice in the White House which allowed uh, Truman to hear Weitzman and there's an Esther figure, similar to maybe Kushner now. Um, and uh, I don't know how far you want to take that. <laughs> 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 um, Come on. <laughs> and there's increasingly um, this alliance between Trump and Bibi, and both, both figures are incredibly unpopular among American Jews. So even if there is a Kushner figure in this White House, there certainly won't be in um, in future White Houses, and you mentioned the Iran deal. That's the Jews overwhelmingly in America uh, uh, support the Iran deal, um, and to me, I'm, I'm worried that if there's this 
alliance, which is just centered around conservative politics between uh, Israel and American Jews, that there might be a demand on behalf of the American Jews for renegotiating of the the um, bond between the two communities. So Jack, I was wondering Jacob, where you see yeah, it in 10 years. No, I really appreciate the, the question. Uh, and you're touching on, on one of my deepest fears about the Trump era, uh, which is that Israel will cease uh, being uh, a source of, will, will, will stop getting bipartisan support. Uh, and we're, we're well on our way there already. You know, it struck me during the, uh, the, pri the Democratic primaries, uh, Bernie Sanders, who uh, you, uh, you know from your, uh, your, your old days, uh, Bernie Sanders, who is, to my mind, the most anti-Israel uh, figure to emerge uh, uh, in, uh, in, in mainstream American politics, uh, nevertheless felt the need to c always say, I'm pro-Israel. He said at one point, I'm 100% pro-Israel, and then proceeded to dismantle the 100%. Uh, but what, uh, what worries me is that the next Bernie Sanders down the line is not going to feel the same need to reaffirm how he really is pro-Israel as he proceeds to be anti-Israel, but we'll cut to the chase. And, and, and the danger of an overly intimate relationship between Netanyahu and Trump is that it sends a message to liberal American Jews that Israel is no longer your issue. Uh, I saw a, a, um, a YouTube clip today of uh, the uh, BDS protest at Columbia University last night against Israel's ambassador to the UN, Danny Danone. And uh, they were chanting, uh, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and, uh, and Netanyahu Trump. And uh, there's a great danger. And liberal American Jews are going to be, may find themselves in an even more difficult situation. And I hope that, that, that the Israeli government won't, won't make things even more difficult for them. Max, I can ask you to cut the line once more to get an online question. And I'm sure you have a question from a woman because I really don't want it to seem that there are voices here that aren't being heard and I want to strongly encourage some alternate voices or, or uh, from other parts of uh, our viewership. It's not a woman, uh, but it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, and this comes from uh, Mohammed Navid uh, via Twitter, I believe. Uh, he's asking Yossi, uh, how can the center on both sides get a stronger voice and also build partnerships for dialogue? Uh, well, first of all, Mohammed, uh, thank you for the question. Um, Mohammed is um, is a partner in the work we do here at Hartman uh, with uh, with Muslim leadership, and uh, so thank you, Mohammed, for for your partnership, for your friendship, and uh, and for the question. And I think first of all, what we need to to nurture. Uh, in our conversations with each other is, um, is a sense of, um, of, of shared purpose and destiny on the one hand without minimizing the difficulties and disagreements between Muslims and Jews. We have very, we, we have very, very deep differences, disagreements, and at the same time, uh, I think that Muslims and Jews increasingly feel, uh, many of us, that if we don't start putting a break on, on, on the, the conflict between us, uh, th we are all heading over the, over, over the abyss. And so the kind of dialogue that we've been nurturing here at Hartman uh, between Muslims and Jews is a very hard dialogue. As my, my partner, Abdullah and Tepli, uh, together we, we direct a program called the Muslim Leadership Initiative here. And uh, as Abdullah puts it, uh, we, don't, we don't do hummus. We do also, but we don't, we don't only do hummus. And we, we start with the hard questions. Um, generally, in Muslim Jewish dialogue, there is an attempt to try to circumvent the difficulties and to emphasize how 
we're all children of Abraham. Uh, we we all believe in uh, in the same God. We're etc. And that is, of course, a, 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 a crucial component of our relationship, but it's not enough. Because if we, if we leave out the difficulties, then sooner or later our dialogue is going to, to become dysfunctional. There'll be a war in Gaza, there'll be some other, there'll be a terror attack, there'll be something that will, that will intrude on the well-intentioned dialogue and, and make it impossible. And so what we are trying to do here in our work, uh, and Mohammed, uh, I, I, I look forward to working with you on, in, on these projects, is how do people of goodwill come together to talk about the deep difficulties, the deep divides between us, uh, as well as exploring the, the, the similarities. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna have to call a hard stop here because I want to, first of all, not be the last person standing between you and some food, which we have here for those of us, uh, those of you here in the audience uh, at the Institute at 7.30, there's a, the program continues and we have about 10 minutes and I don't want you to be the last ones in the queue for sandwiches. So I'm going to say uh, thank you very much. All in. Uh, One more. I, I really have to stop. We can we can have Before offline conversations. I know. I, am, yes, I, am. I know, but we'll, we'll, maybe we'll save and it I for tie, the. I tie 67. I, to I, I'm, I'm sure we will, and I'm sure we'll save it for the director's cut at some point. But I'm really sorry. We have to end now. You're, thank you very much. Thank you for staying. Thank, thank you for being thank online. We're thank going, you, Alan. Thank you, Yossi. We're going off the air now. Anybody who was staying here in the Institute, there are sandwiches, as I said, and then the rest of the program tonight.